So hello everyone. My name is Bogdan Sass. I am a principal solution architect with SciScale. And uh, I'm here to talk to you about uh, a solution that we at SciScale have been developing. It's called Arcana. It's uh, a short name for a very long, an abbreviation for a very long name, actually. Automated Root Cause Analysis Neural Network Assisted. Before uh, we discuss what Arcana does, I want to tell you why we started work on this project. And just to give you a little bit of a background, I am uh, a networker and a sysadmin. I started working with computer networks uh, a while ago, a little bit over 15 years ago. And uh, I've gone through CCNA, CCMP, CCIE. I've um, gone, I've moved on to data center virtualization. And then it was only a small step to move to operating system virtualization to container technologies, Docker and Kubernetes. And during these years, I've seen um, the same process again and again. I've seen what happens when something isn't working. What generally happens here? Somebody just notified, you get an alert. The apps team says, nope, it's not us, it's the network guys. The network team, it's not us, the server is the issue. The, ser the server team, of course, not us, it's the app. A lot of time passes, nobody knows where the issue is, nobody, maybe hours later, nobody even knows where to get started on fixing that issue. And the problem here was very well pointed out by Marcel earlier. It's, um, I wanted to use this image. I wanted to talk about searching for a needle in a haystack, but I think Marcel put it uh, much better. It's a cat and mice game, and the mice are multiplying like crazy. Just a few years ago, you had your physical server and you had uh, your application. If you had a problem, it was the network, the server, or the application. Now you have the hypervisor. Now you have the container. You have the container orchestrator. You have um, storage that might be local or it might be over the network. You have much more places in which something can go wrong. And identifying the true culprit when something does go wrong is becoming a more and more difficult task. But we also have some very nice, very useful technology that can help us. And since I don't know if everybody here is uh, familiar with Elasticsearch and the Elastic Stack, I will just uh, do a very quick presentation of them. First of all, Elasticsearch started as a tool for searching through huge amounts of text. Even now, when you talk to, the, to an Elasticsearch cluster, it replies with, you know, for search. But the truth is, it is no longer just for search. It is um, also a very powerful way of dealing with time series data. And nowadays, we are seeing Elasticsearch being used more and more for monitoring because it's a very, it works very well as a kind of NoSQL database. We can just populate it with the time series data, the metrics that you want to collect, and then aggregate, correlate, work with those metrics. Also, around Elasticsearch, we have an entire ecosystem now. It's the Elastic Stack. It was originally called ELK for Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. But then they added the, the bits, the lightweight log shippers, and somehow neither Belk or Black or uh, ELBK sounded very well, so they decided to simply rename it to the Elastic Stack. So this is what we have. 
we have very powerful tools that allow us to collect the data. We have very powerful tools that allow us to centralize the data and put it in one place. But still, we still have two problems here. The first one is that the data comes from many sources. If you've ever had to collect information from multiple devices belonging to multiple vendors, you already know this issue. I want to know what user has performed a specific action. And all the actions are logged. But what is the field for the user? Is it user? Username? User dot name? Nginx dot access dot user underscore name? It's very difficult to correlate data when the fields that are being used differ between different tools and different vendors. And this is where Elastic has come up with a very nice idea. It's called the Elastic Common Schema. It's an open source specification that defines a common set of document fields, document fields for data. Once you apply this Elastic Common Schema, once all your data is indexed in the same way, it becomes easy to correlate data from different data sources. So that's one problem that I don't want to say it is solved, but it is in the process of being solved. The second problem when collecting data is this one. This is uh, an actual demo uh, created by the people at Elastic. It shows a real life troubleshooting scenarios using Elastic Search for a problem that occurred in an application. It's a basic application with multiple uh, processes, multiple microservices making up that application. And at some point, we get an alert. And as usual, the alert doesn't say too much. Poor performance on the server. From there, we go to the dashboards. And without going into the details, we start to dig. We start to look what has happened. When has the problem started? Does it have a clear start and end point? We, we dive in. We look at the actual uh, server application performance monitor. We look at the response times. We still don't see a smoking gun. All the response times are very long. We switch. We go into the containers. We dig a little bit deeper. We see that there seems to be a problem with one of the containers running on one of the nodes. We go into that container and we see some spikes on, on the CPU usage. We go there and finally we look at the processes. We see that there is a backup process that actually um, runs at a certain interval and everything becomes slow while that backup process is running. Sorry. Now I went very quickly to all of this, but the problem here is that there are many sources of data, many places where something could go wrong. And many times we do not know where to start. We start digging, look at the servers, look at the network, look at the application. In the end, we will manage to isolate the problem, but it takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of time. And the question was, can we do things better can we improve the time it takes to identify the actual root cause? And we believe we can, because the problem here is how do we make sense of the mountain of data? How do we use the machine to help us, to give us a starting point, to point us in the right direction for identifying the root cause? Enter Arcana. This part here is what we already have. This is Elasticsearch collecting data from our infrastructure. Everything in the infrastructure is monitored. We have telemetry. We have the information going into Elasticsearch. We can, with Arcana, we can do first event clustering. We put together the events that occur together, the events that probably have a common root cause. Then we try to identify 
the probable root cause for those events. And with that, sorry, with that, we can engage the appropriate team. Once the problem has been solved, the feedback actually goes back into Arcana. We tell the system what has happened, whether the determination was correct or not, and the system learns from our feedback. How does it work? Again, we have our system. We have uh, the Elasticsearch with all the data. We have Arcana, which is uh, basically a plugin for Kibana, the data visualization uh, and the console for Elasticsearch. And inside, we are running a TensorFlow supervised machine learning model that actually gets access to all the data. So the machine learning system looks at the data and tries to identify what the root cause might be. Again, to give you the full flow, what has happened? What are the events? What does the machine think that the root cause is here? Identify what the potential root cause is for this set of events. Is that enough? Is the determination correct? We don't know. Right now, it is not. But we provide feedback. After the troubleshooting steps have been completed, after the root cause has been positively identified, the user provides feedback for our camera. The user tells the system, yes, you are right, this was the actual root cause, or no, that was not correct, the actual root cause was something else, it was that one. And the system learns, and all the data also goes back into Elastic Stack, into Elastic Search. And with this information, the system continually improves. With time, it learns to identify the root cause correctly. And this is what we have now. But what about the future? How can this system be used in the future? I need to, to specify that we are not there yet, but think of a future in which we can actually take action when we are reasonably confident that the root cause has been correctly identified. What if we are more than 80% sure that the issue was a backup process running on the database server? Can we go in and automate the solution? We believe we can. If we have a certain confidence threshold and we are above that threshold, we just go in, we run an Ansible script, the script goes to the server and takes corrective action. We might be heading to a point where uh, the problem is solved before the users even notice it. It will not apply to all the problems, but if it applies to 50, 60, 70% of the problems, it will free up a lot of time, a lot of resources for the people actually doing the investigation. Now, just to show you what the interface looks like, this is the interface for Arcana. If you have ever worked with Elasticsearch, it will look very familiar because it is nothing more than another plugin for Kibana. This is where you define the machine learning jobs. This is where you tell it what fields to take into consideration for the ML job. And of course, you can also rename some of the fields if you need to, to do so. You can rename them from the interface. The ML job starts running, and in the end, we get an output like this. These are the events that were identified, and I cannot believe that these three are part of the same set of symptoms. They have the same underlying root cause. 
we have a web server reporting an internal server error, a 500 error message. We have an, a SQL server saying that it's unable to write to disk. We have a server that is out of memory. Arcana believes that this out of memory was the root cause. Arcana believes that we should investigate this particular server first. Is it correct? Is it not? We go in, we investigate, we perform our investigation, our troubleshooting steps as usual. And in the end, these are actually toggles. You, you can switch them between root cause and symptoms. In the end, you can go in and tell the system, yes, good job, or no, that was not correct. Try to do better next time. And the system will improve. Keep in mind that there already is a level of machine learning in the Elastic Stack. Elastic Search already has unsupervised machine learning that can already reduce some of the noise. It can detect only anomalies. It can detect um, when something deviates from normal. We are adding on top of that. We are adding the supervised machine learning component and the automated root cause analysis. So the tools that we have go up to step three that Marcel mentioned earlier. Now we are adding step four, the automated RCA, automated root cause analysis. And of course, on top of that, you can add Slack, you can notify the correct teams, you can add playbooks for automatic remediation if uh, the root cause identification is re reasonably confident and you can always provide feedback and the system will learn from the feedback you provide. So that's it for Arcana. Of course, if anybody has any questions, about the system, I will be glad to answer them. Just please don't ask me too much about the machine learning part. I am not a developer. A lot of that is magic to me. I will have to ask my colleagues who have actually written the code for that. Well, fortunately, there there are a number of your colleagues that are um, on the on the call as well. So if you have questions, um, please um, raise your hand in the chat. Um, and Marcel, if you have any comments, um, please please add them now. Some of the developers are also in chat, so if you have any detailed questions about uh, Arcana, they are the people to ask. I see Colleen here in the chat with us, so I do have the people who can answer. Yeah, one one remark for me, and this is Marcel again. So I really like the setup that you are trying to plug into existing technology. Um, because I think that's crucial that you need to have your monitoring stack in place before you actually can do put some AI or machine learning on top of it. So it nicely integrates um, with what people already have, but then improves gradually um, their solution. And I also, also think that the feedback loop is a very important Thing that most people um, yeah, often oversee, overlook, because in the end, a machine can only be as smart as you train it to be. Um, so maybe one question for for your developers would be: um, Is there a way, um, or did you did you analyze how much better um, the the network got over time, and how much feedback was required to train it up to? a certain point where it could reliably identify some of the root causes? Hey, uh, it's Kevin here. Um, well, currently we're not quite at that point yet, so I couldn't give you an exact uh, number of iterations. It, it, largely depends on the data you give it. So we're not quite at that point. It's still, yeah. Uh, yeah. 
we're still at the start, let's say. But I do have some good news uh, here. And uh, I forgot to tell you about that in the presentation. This technology will be open source. And as uh, Karin has said, everything will depend on the size of your network, the complexity of your network, uh, the type of data you're collecting, the type of issues you're encountering, how many of them are repeated, how many of them are new, and so on. But everything, all the code will be open sourced. So very soon, you will be able to take the code, implement Arcana in your own network, and see whether it uh, works for your particular uh, use case. Yeah, that's that's a very very good um, news, and I saw that on your other talk. Um, actually, one of our team members um, also prototyped some a similar solution, and I see already some some place for collaboration there. So we also plug into Elastic, and we train a model, not a neural network model, but a, a model of a self-organizing map, to flag anomalies in log files. You're going one step further of um, actually pinning down some root causes. We're only looking at a stream of log file messages and wants to detect something anomalous in the content of those messages. But given that two parties came to a similar design um, independently, I think that's that's a good proof.
So um, I'm Brian, I'm an SA over at, at Profit Store, and I'm gonna be talking about Disk Profit. And what Disk Profit does is we use machine learning AI to predict future disk failures up to six weeks in advance. And additionally, we can also predict performance and capacity for up to 90 days into the future, as well as give correlation for the effects of disk failure between the node, application, and cluster. And uh, our biggest use case right now is for Ceph. So I know that a lot of you might not be very familiar with Ceph, but all you really need to know is, it, is that it's a distributed storage system that's self-healing and fault tolerant due to redundancy, which makes it really good for big data storage. And you can kind of extrapolate this use case to all, all distributed clusters. So in 2016, we partnered with uh, another big company that actually presented at Red Hat Storage Day in Seattle um, that wanted to do a petabyte Ceph cluster for OpenStack Cloud. And they found there was three major stability issues with the Ceph cluster that was sort of blocking their project. The first one was that every time a disk failed or an OSD failed, the, the map would change, the crush map, which would cause p uh, placement group peering and backfilling, or the cluster would rebalance to heal itself, but then this would take up cluster resources and the client would receive slower performance. The second issue was that the data distribution wasn't balanced. The cluster had no visibility of the underlying disk capacities. So if you had different capacity disks in your cluster, some disks might be at 90% while the cluster was only at 50% full. And then the user wouldn't know until one day the OSD just couldn't write, couldn't be written into anymore because it was full. And then the third issue they found was that one slow disk, a single slow disk would affect the performance of the entire cluster. And then this would just continue to drag on the performance until it was, it was ejected because the cluster had no visibility over the health of the disks underneath. And so they proposed a solution with our disk profit prediction, which was much less mature at that time, but it essentially did the same thing. We could predict disk failures six weeks in advance. And then they had, they drew out all this uh, architecture stuff, but the most important thing is this graph at the bottom right. You can see that there's a normal workload here of around 400 or so IOPS. And then when they, when they simulated a disk failure by just pulling a disk, they found that the cluster performance dropped below 200. So they dropped around uh, 40 to 50% IOPS and uh, persisted that way. Oh, sorry. It persisted that way for the whole duration of the test. So 800 minutes around uh, 12 hours or so. Versus with our disk prediction, you can see that with being able to know a disk is about to fail in advance, we can take preemptive uh, measures. We can disable the cluster rebalancing and then we can rem remove it, the disk and replace it within an hour and have the performance go back up to uh, a fraction of the time, in a, in a fraction of the time, right? And then the same company tested our, our prediction engine against 20,000 drives over the course of 90 days. And they found that we had an accuracy rate of 96% and a recall rate of 97%. And the recall rate is actually the more important statistic here. It's, um, it's the number of correctly predicted failed disks over total number of failed disks. So out of every 100 disks that failed, we would correctly predict 97 of them. And then this is just shows that we're already integrated in the Ceph community. We're, a, we're called the disk prediction plugin. You can just enable us through the manager daemon, and then you can just use uh, Ceph native commands to access our prediction. And uh, yeah, so we're, we released with Nautilus for older versions of Ceph, you would use this, this one line uh, installation. And you can, you can use that with Ansible, Chef, Puppet, any kind of automation software to make it simple for a mass deployment. And our biggest, uh, our biggest account right now is actually in Michigan. There's three universities, Wayne State, Michigan State, and University of Michigan. And what, what their setup is, they, all three of these campuses share a single giant Ceph cluster, and they put all their research data on the Ceph cluster. So it's, they have to make the Ceph cluster as resilient as possible. And so what we provide is just the disk predictions and allowing them to 
monitor the health of their discs before they fail. Right. And uh, I'm just going to go through a quick live demo. I'm going to switch screens here. Can you guys see my my web browser? Yes. Okay. So what we have is just a simple software as a service uh, cloud login. When you go and you see a dashboard, and it just gives you a, a really quick overview of how many disks are being monitored, how many are good, how many are bad, are going to uh, fail in less than two weeks, less than six weeks. And you can go to the disk health list here to get a list of every single disk that's being monitored. And then you have all the UI unique identifiers and which node it's on, the size, the serial number, the vendor, all over here. Oh, sorry. All over here so you can see that, uh, so you can easily identify the disk. So, uh, yeah, so this is, so this would be where you would go for the disk details. And then we also, I alluded to it earlier, we also have prediction for capacity and performance. So over here, we have uh, the cluster capacity, but we also go down to the OSD level. I'll just use, I'll just use pools because it's more, more interesting. And then we can predict future use, future capacity for the next, up to next 90 days. But of course, this depends on how much data you have. So the general rule of thumb is um, for every cycle that we predict, we need three cycles of that data. So if we have 10, if we can predict 10 days of into the future, we would need 30 days of data. All right. And uh, yeah, that's about all we do. That's that's the end of my 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 thing. I just have some screenshots. Awesome. Thank you. This is great. Uh, the other thing, um, can you uh, maybe step over to where that Ceph plugin is um, for disk protection, so that we have the um, the URL in front of us while we're. Oh uh, yeah. Okay. Actually, I can just go into it in my Ceph disk protection. I didn't realize that it was um, a plugin already to Ceph. So yeah, that Ceph is kind yeah. of near and dear we to our. Work with, uh, we work with Sage, the creator of Ceph, and he mm -hmm. got us in there pretty quick. So pretty good. Great to know, um, as we've got a lot of Ceph folks using um, using Ceph and here at Red Hat and elsewhere. So yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. So one, one interesting thing to note here is that you can run the prediction in the cloud or local. Um, so you could also run this setup in a completely um, non-software as a service environment as well. Yeah, because uh, in order to be with Ceph, they wanted like a lightweight version of our predictor. And then, uh, so we would we just gave them like a, one with, with less uh, baggage that would be only 70% accurate that they could enable uh, locally, but it, would, it wouldn't use all the metrics that were provided for the prediction. It, it was requested by them to have a local lightweight, lightweight uh, package. Okay. Yeah. So once again, um, I'll unmute all. And um, if you have questions, please ask them. I'm going to switch over and um, share my screen. Okay. Uh, so I have the notes here. So share. Um, and you may all notice that I've added as many names as I recognize um, from the chat into the attendees list. If I got your affiliation wrong, please pop into the um, Hacker MD, the Hack MD notes, and um, and correct me. Um, we're almost. We've got about 10 minutes left, um, Marcel, and I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, some of the goals for this group. One, one is we're just trying to reach out and build the community around AI ops here and um, make sure that um, we have some of the resources that people are looking at and requiring. Um, so thank you both, um, Bogdan and Brian, for sharing your um, insights and your tooling. Um, that's it's a great start. Uh, and if there are other topics that people want to talk about or present on or questions you have, um, please um, reach out to us. Again, sign up through the, the Google groups um, and, and ask for those. If there's anyone here that, in, and I'll look in the chat, um, that has any questions 
not seeing any. Um, um, I'm hoping that some of you will have some suggestions for upcoming topics and we can move forward. We were, we're planning on doing this on Mondays at nine o'clock, AKA the time we started today over the next few months and doing it once a month and trying to pull together something um, at Red Hat Summit, which is in May. Um, if you're interested in having maybe a lunch and learn um, on the topic, we'll all be in Boston at that time. Um, as well as I'm looking to um, host what we call an OpenShift Commons gathering, which is our face-to-face -face time for OpenShifters and people in the Kubernetes um, in ecosystem in the Bay Area sometime around September. So if you're interested in getting together then, um, please reach out to Marcel or myself and um, we'll start coordinating um, a face-to-face -face, um, sometime probably in September on this. So Marcel, if, um, if you wanted to add a few more words in here, I've added a few resources down the end. If everybody could send me PDF versions of their slide decks um, to dmuller at redhat.com, that would be great and I'll add them in as well. Marcel? Yeah, I'm just um, really excited that we gathered so many people, also not only from the presenting companies, but also from other um, companies in this first kickoff meeting here. And I'm really looking forward to extend that to other people in the community um, to, well, to enlarge this community or to create a community. So, um, once we have our website up, um, please make sure that you register your email there for additional updates or go to the Google group that we have there so that we don't miss any of the sessions that we hopefully continue to do on a monthly basis. And I'm really looking forward to collaborate you, uh, with you on GitHub and in an open source way. That's all I have. And it, it, it's great to see so much of this stuff um, uh, from to scale and from profit store being done out in the open too. So this is this is great, and um, we look forward to more of that. So um, thank you again to our speak guest speakers, and we'll um, post this uh, the video of this session to the, the Google Groups list, and um, I'll create a YouTube playlist for um, these topics and um, edit them and get them up hopefully in the next 24 hours or so. Is there anything else anyone would like to add um, while we're here? I'm just checking the chat again and I'm not. So hopefully I've gotten everybody's affiliations correct. Um, if not, I posted the link already into the, the Google group and we will um, we can correct it from there. So um, thanks again, everybody, for attending, and we'll be back again in another month. Okay. Thanks, Diane, for organizing this, and see you again soon. Bye bye. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.